December the 11th, 2005. Damage. Emergency. Hello, can the fire engines, please? What's wrong? Um, it's on Maylands Avenue. There's been an explosion. I live on Mason's Road, and it's at the house that I look on to. There's been a huge explosion near Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire. It happened at Buntsfield Oil Depot around 6 o'clock this morning. There we were driving along what appeared to be like a normal estate, uh, industrial estate, and then suddenly you go around a corner and you were in a scene of complete devastation like something out of a science fiction film with cars overturned, buildings blown in, with all the windows gone. It's exactly a decade since the largest ever explosion in peacetime Europe. Early in the morning on December the 11th, the Bunsfield oil depot blast rocked businesses and homes and had a lasting impact on the way companies deal with safety procedures. Miraculously, no one was killed in the blast or the three-day fire which followed after vapour from thousands of gallons of petrol ignited. Emergency. About 25 minutes ago, we all heard a, a phenomenal explosion and there's flames and clouds. Oh, there's been a huge explosion. I think it's between Cherry Trees Lane, Woodhall Farm, Hemel Hempstead. Huge explosion. We heard an explosion about a uh, quarter of an hour ago. You can hear car alarms going off. I would say it looked like there was some smoke coming over towards the southern side of Harpenden. In this Bob FM News special, we'll hear from the people directly affected, as well as the emergency services whose response to major incidents has been shaped by the disaster. Hertfordshire's Chief Fire Officer Roy Wilshire was gold commander on the morning, meaning he oversaw the unprecedented emergency response. As a Chief Fire Officer, you don't get many phone calls in the middle of the night anymore. So when you do get one, you know it's something serious. So I got a call probably about ten past six, a few minutes after the incident itself and uh, the first words on the other end of the phone was Governor Bunsfield's alight. The first thing you do is start to make plans based on your initial information. Way back then, if you remember, if we go back to 2005, one of the first things we started to think about was, was it terrorism? First question, is this terrorism or was this an accident? And quite quickly, we were able, through eyewitness accounts, to say that it was an accident, industrial accident, and not terrorism. That was an important message to get out. Well, just as important now, but it's certainly important back then. We'll hear more from Roy Wilshire and how his team's response shaped emergency planning across the world shortly. Well, it was a fuel vapour explosion equivalent to 30 tonnes of TNT at the depot, which triggered a blast wave heard in surrounding areas and as far away as Holland. You've been telling us what you remember. We was living in Croxley Green in a flat at the time. I was five months pregnant. I got woken up from my sleep because it sounded... Like, the door banged and it almost felt like the flat actually shook. I did kind of keep thinking that maybe it had been an earthquake or in my kind of wild imagination, I was thinking maybe aliens had landed and were about to take over. That was Bob FM listener Helena Robinson speaking to us. Neris Adams from Stevenage also heard the blast. It must have been about six in the morning, half six or something like that. And I was just awoken with <laughs> the bed vibrating the door banging as though someone had shut or slammed the front door of the house and it just sort of shook me awake. I thought we'd been burgled. I thought someone had broken in. So I tried waking the other half up thinking, you know, did you feel that? And he said, I must have been dreaming and heard nothing. It's just incredible, though, to think, well, that's over in Hemel Hempstead. That's still some distance away. Well, I was actually living in Hatfield. It was just absolutely bizarre. And we were going to Watford that day as well. So we took a drive through all the traffic to Watford and you could see all the smoke and all the chaos going on. It was just absolutely unreal. One of the first firefighters on the scene after the explosion, Kevin O'Neill, has been telling us he knew something was wrong before the emergency call came in. Kevin describes the windows of Hemel Hempstead Fire Station rattling and a colleague spotting a huge plume of smoke moments after disaster struck. Back in those days we had uh, old metal framed windows and the, uh, the blast from the initial explosion rattled the windows before we even heard the blast. So we were kind of made prior aware that uh, something significant had happened. Uh, one of my colleagues was in the upper part of the building on the first floor at the time as well, and, and he actually saw the glow in the sky, um, which I initially thought was a plane crash. Kevin was driving the first fire engine to arrive. 
He and his team then, over the next few days, used 53 million litres of water fighting the fire and 786,000 litres of foam. Pretty crazy. After the initial explosion, there were a number of repeated explosions involving the Avgas tanks. Uh, so, uh, on our first arrival, we've got a predetermined uh, rendezvous point, which we, we, we go to. And both appliances attended that from different directions, which is kind of a strategic approach in case there's any issues for getting to the site. There was a few walking wounded to deal with that were, were, were leaving the site as we arrived, so obviously we, we had to make sure we dealt with them and, and, and find out who else was there uh, is the initial uh, actions that we need to follow, obviously. As we've already heard, nobody was killed, possibly due to the fact that this happened so early on a Sunday morning. Here's retired paramedic Gary Sanderson, who looked after some of the walking wounded. My initial thoughts were, uh, it was just un I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Even travelling down the A414, there was lots and lots of cars were stopped because the, the Park Street roundabout and the M10 going towards Hemel Hemp's area was shut by the police. So, and I could see it in the distance, so I knew it was going to be devastating by the, the, what we were seeing on the way to it. You're pretty used to seeing some harrowing scenes. Could anything have ever maybe prepared you for something like this? At the time, um, my colleagues and I in the Beds and Hearts Ambulance Service, then we all prepare for dealing with major incidents, but you hope you never do deal with major incidents. That sounds bizarre. But, you know, to get there, to be part of that team with the Hearts Fire Service, the Hearts Police... All the voluntary and utility service was amazing. Now, I'm proud to be part of that. And, uh, you know, thankfully, there wasn't anybody seriously injured or killed at the time. Over the next few hours, the true extent of damage began to emerge. Pat Berry was working for Hertfordshire Police at the time. She describes the scene which met her. I went to the site, which I found absolutely amazing experience. Obviously, we could go to the parts where the public couldn't go, where it was taped off. And there we were driving along what appeared to be like a normal estate. And then suddenly you go around a corner and you were in a scene of complete devastation, like something out of a science fiction film with cars overturned, buildings blown in, with all the windows gone, the flames were still rising from, uh, from the explosion, the big cloud of smoke. And uh, yeah, it was just, everything was really eerie, really strange. Could anything have ever prepared you for what you saw on that day? Well, I wasn't that prepared for it, I have to say. Um, but uh, the main, the best thing about it was no one was killed. It was like a war zone. And one of the buildings there, uh, one of the firms, Northgate, was where my husband worked. A number of homes and businesses were wrecked by the explosion. Jerry Stone worked for one of them. His office was a little too close for comfort. It was the very closest building to the tanks that exploded. And my desk was actually just the other side of a window, which uh, looked out onto the tanks. So I couldn't have really been any closer had I been there. But uh, the amazing thing is that the previous day, on Saturday afternoon, we had a children's Christmas party in the restaurant, which was just along from my office. So again, it was the side that overlooked the tanks. The very first day I started there, 10 years before, as I was taken around the building, we went up the stairwell where the uh, windows looked out over the car park and towards the tanks. And uh, the person taking me around actually said, uh, over there are the tanks which will take this building when they go up. It took 10 years before that happened. It was certainly in some people's mind it would be way back then. A number of smaller businesses faced financial ruin as a result of the explosion. But what about the company Jerry was working for? As a computer company, we kept all of our backup tapes off-site three quarters of a mile down the road and we had uh, a disaster recovery set up and we took our backup tapes down there uh, loaded them up and essentially recreated all of the systems and we were up and running uh, not only that but we acted as a bureau running packages for other companies we ran every single payroll on time that was quite an achievement Walking near the site today, the area appears to have largely recovered visually, but small businesses in the area, including cab drivers, catering companies 
Cleaners and couriers saw trade dwindle as they were less in demand from firms on mainlands. Now, a series of recovery projects have since been launched, including plans to incentivise big business into the area with one of the government's enterprise zones. Chancellor George Osborne approved the plans in the last couple of weeks, which centre around bringing in environmental technology companies to the area. Neil Hayes is Executive Director of Hertfordshire's Local Enterprise Partnership, which submitted the bid. What is needed in terms of uh, to, to develop Maylands further is you know, high calibre, high quality office space uh, to attract some of those companies possibly out of London or from other places in and around the South East. So what, essentially what, what we've got there is uh, the ability to build new uh, office space at a location that's fantastic right next to the, to the M1 and hopefully attract uh, in, investment from overseas or from other parts of the UK. This enterprise zone covers West Hertfordshire, but would you say Bunsford just needs that extra attention? I think so. I mean, I, I have to say, I think you know, Bunsfield has bounced back over those those past ten years. And but what this will do in an enterprise zone state is that over a, you know essentially a twenty year period, we're looking to attract over eight thousand new jobs and over eight hundred new businesses. Um, so you know that's a significant growth of the business population and a significant growth in jobs over a longer period, and actually gives the ability to to grow those jobs in sectors that are fit for the future. A number of years on from that day where flames climbed hundreds of feet into the dark sky, blocking out daylight and causing utter devastation, it's clear that some good has come out of the disaster. The emergency services would like the reality of Bunsfield to remain a memory, but their response back in 2005 has helped to form today's national template for tackling major incidents. Chief Fire Officer Roy Wilshire, who was in charge on the day, explains. A lot of people don't realise that we, we'd been down the site four times the year before Bunsfield blew up. Training for the planned event, was one, which was one or two tanks a night, not 22, and not an explosion of that size. So people have often said, well, how do you fight a fire that side? Well, I know about incident command. I know how to put out oil fires. It was just the scale that was different, and you had to make sure you had the scale. So that regular training, and we've worked very closely with the on-site operators for years now, uh, to fitting in new um, pumping equipment, new foam equipment, new training. We're always down there training at the moment, so that's great. The interesting thing is we now talk about national resilience in terms of the fire service. If you look at the floods that's just happened in current Cumbria over this weekend, we have uh, tactical advisors, we have a national coordination and advisory framework for fire, we have national strategic advisors of which I'm one, we have things that are called strategic holding areas where we gather all our resources. Most of that system we use now for national emergencies is based on what happened at Bunsfield. Many people I spoke to for this Bob FM News special have told me they can't believe time has passed so quickly. But with five companies since ordered to pay a total of nearly £10 million for their part in the disaster and improved emergency response and safety procedures as a result, it's clear that time has passed for the better. Much has been achieved, including significant economic plans which it's hoped will give this area in Hemel Hempstead the boost that business leaders believe it so richly deserves.